Hello everyone, my name is Jenna and I'm one of the youth at Westdale United Church. You might know my mother, Rebecca Jackson Gravely, who coordinates various youth events and directs the annual Christmas pageant. I have been going to Westdale United for 17 years since I was born, and I have always been somewhat involved in church activities, for example singing for the church at the Christmas pageant and participating in events such as Case for Kids and Wesley Urban Ministries Homeless Shelter Volunteering. For this Sunday's reflection, I have been asked to speak on a relevant topic of my interest and passion. I have decided to talk about the most relatable trends and challenges we have all experienced throughout this pandemic. When COVID-19 hit, it shocked all of us, however it did not hit all of us the same. With everyone's separate, individual, and intensely intricate lives, there is no single recommendation to keep everyone safe, functioning, and healthy. Regardless, there are universal protocols and restrictions that emitted, emitted by our health officials and governments that everyone is required to follow. In fact, for these protocols, a collection of stigmas sprouted. In the beginning, everyone wanted to do everything they could to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We were just learning how to do so, and we were all scared. I remember how terrified I was to go to the convenience store. We were wiping down our groceries with bleach. We were told to wear a mask and stay home, and at first, that's exactly what we did. The entire province shut down for weeks. The funny thing is, I thought it was going to be over after March break. I thought it was just one of those funny things that wouldn't happen to me, to us. Oh, how wrong I was. This affected us all. Pretty soon, we started to see government-issued signs mounted on grocery store walls and in public bathrooms, on the front of gyms, and in clothing store windows. They read, before entering, check if you have any of the following symptoms, wear a mask, and stay home, stay safe. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with social media, but on the app Instagram, people began to reinforce these regulations and support them very publicly and vocally by posting almost accusatory statements, encouraging their peers to stay inside and stop seeing friends, wear a mask whenever you leave the house, etc. I remember one of my friends posting something along the lines of, how selfish can you be to still be seeing groups of friends in the middle of a pandemic? Grow up. The thing is, they aren't wrong. Just because we young people are strong and healthy doesn't mean we can go around spreading this virus like wildfire. From this concept, the stigma that everyone must follow all COVID protocols if we don't want to be a bad person emerged. The funny thing is, it's a good stigma, because it keeps people safe. But the even funnier thing is, the people reinforcing the stigma. Actually, it's pretty infuriating. In the first few months of COVID, a group of inspiring, kind, and totally helpful billionaires rearranged their million dollar yachts to form the words, stay home in the water. Then they sent their thousand dollar drone to take a picture of it to post on social media. These billionaires continue to tell people to stay home and keep others safe when they have over 10,000 square feet to stay home in. It's easier for them to say, but for others, it's not. Many people still have to go to work to keep their apartments, to keep their children's stomachs full. They don't have the option to stay home, stay safe. They don't have three mansions and two yachts to pick from. These billionaires continue to do things such as arranging their yachts in useless, hypocritical messages instead of donating to disaster relief or families who were actually hit hard by COVID-19. It's offensive. I keep on seeing these trends in social media. Rich people floating in their safe little bubbles, asking unrealistic behavior of the lower classes. A month ago, I saw one of my favorite rappers post on Instagram. The posting read, everyone, we're in this together, so wear that mask, stay home from that party, God bless your families, and screw COVID-19. Two Fridays ago, I saw him posting videos of a penthouse party he was having with hundreds of maskless celebrities, dancing and popping champagne. Safe to say, I don't like him very much anymore, and he is only one of the many uber-wealthy people I have seen exhibiting this hypocritical behavior. It is relevant to refer to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 3 to 5, which states the following. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the play in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Not only is it hypocritical, but it causes you to look at the bigger picture. Maybe these celebrities really do mean it when they tell others to stay home and stay safe, because they know that unlike them, others do not have the luxury of the highest quality privatized healthcare in the world. Others do not have an underground pre-order of vaccines ready to be delivered to their doorstep at a moment's notice. Because that's how this world works. One socioeconomic class status ultimately decides whether or not they'll receive healthcare or, or relief first. It's almost always the rich who reap the benefits first. 
the proof is in the pudding. The richest countries in the world receive the vaccine first and in the greatest quantity. These countries are the United States, China, Canada, the UK, Australia, and some others. Vaccine distribution has hardly reached any periphery countries, including Yemen, which is already facing the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. In this time, we should refer to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 to 14. Jesus says, When we notice how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host come, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. As I mentioned earlier, there have been numerous trends on social media that have surfaced in light of this pandemic. These trends are largely due to the youth, including myself, who tend to use social media the most. Seeing as we're all stuck inside, we have taken to social media to express our concerns about popular topics and social justice movements. One of these movements included the feminist hashtag she was walking home movement, which was about the young woman in the UK named Sarah Everand, who was sexually assaulted and murdered by a police officer when she was walking home. Sarah Evans' assault and murder were a stark reminder that even though we're stuck inside, the world around us is still moving, changing, and fighting at the same pace it was before. Personally, it left me feeling useless and incapable of making a difference from where I was, stuck in my bedroom, staring wistfully out my window. We've now had to find new ways to advocate for social justice, since taking to the streets to protest is a largely unavailable option for many of us at this time. The hashtag she was walking home movement took place almost solely on social media due to the impossibility of holding rallies, protests, and speeches. This then begs the question, how effective is social media at actually raising awareness and truly making a difference? The answer is not enough. It is not effective enough. No matter how much I post about Sarah Everand, I will not see the same results I would have if we could have advocated in person on the streets. I feel so useless. I feel like everything I'm doing is limited to a capacity of 50% like any small business in Ontario. Everything I do feels small scale and unimpactful. Too many times to count, I found myself lying on my white bed sheets, my unkept hair pressing into the mattress, staring up at the ceiling where the shadows cast by the sun still flicker, listening to the static of the birds outside my window who still build their nest, while I remain here, unmoving, unchanging, except for the sweat of my forehead dripping down my neck and soaking my pillow. For goodness sakes, it feels like Groundhog Day, like I'm reliving the same day over and over and over again with nothing new to do. A pandemic is one thing, but feeling like you can do absolutely nothing about it, nothing to stop it, nothing to help, nothing to advocate for it, nothing to change it, is another level of powerlessness I never thought I could reach as an individual. At least, I tell myself, I'm not the only one feeling this way. There have to be other people out there that feel the same type of stagnance in their lives, the same worthlessness. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 7, we are reminded by Jesus that we are not useless or worthless when he says, Why, even the hairs on your head are, still, are all numbered. Fear not, you have more value than many sparrows. Speaking about mental health, it goes without saying that this has been hard for everyone, but what needs to be discussed is how it is hard in different ways for different people. Many people I have spoken to have found themselves forced to choose between their physical well-being and their mental health. Let's be honest, the options are either to stay home and stay safe from COVID-19, but commonly remain only lonely and isolated, or to see a friend or two but run the risk of contracting COVID-19. For some, the choice to stay home may cost them their mental health, which in turn could compromise their physical well-being in severe cases. Sometimes, it's even the dilemma of, do I possibly die here at home, lonely and depressed? Or do I possibly die of COVID-19, but happy because I saw my friends and family one last time? This is a serious choice for some people. 
And though many call it selfish to see friends and family and put others at risk, there are people who may feel like they have nothing to lose with the position they are in. We all live very different lives, face different challenges at very different levels, and it is not up to us to judge others for the decisions they make, as easy as it is. I'm guilty of judging many of my peers who continue to gather in large groups through the peaks of this pandemic. But in the end, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that everyone has a reason. And now more than ever, we need to seek to understand each other and be there for each other, no matter who or what. I live in a large household of amazing people with amazing, kind parents. I have it easy. But I know friends who live with people who aren't so kind, whose parents hurt them, who are forced into nocturnality just so they don't have to suffer the consequences of being awake at the same time as their unpredictable housemates. Maybe that's their reason. No, don't get me wrong. Even if you live in an amazing household with amazing people like me, it is still common to be struggling mentally right now. And that's okay. And remember, it's not just you. We're all tired of saying, I miss you, and I can't wait to see you once this is over. It's not just you. We're all tired of the Zoom meetings, the FaceTime calls, the emails and postcards. Everything is so exhausting. It's not just you. It's me. It's all of us. I remember the first time I broke down at the beginning of the pandemic. I was fine until one night, out of nowhere, I had a disassociative anxiety episode. My dad took me on a walk at 1 a.m., the streets empty, the drips of water falling from the trees to asphalt being the only thing you could hear for miles. It was the emptiest feeling I had ever experienced, one of pure, swirling oblivion. It was more empty than how I felt when I was depressed, because I knew that everyone else was feeling it too. The world was empty this time. Everything void of all activity, not just me. And that is the weirdest sensation a human can experience. To wrap up, I want to leave you with this. Remember that we're so close to this being over. We're so close to that hug from someone you've been craving a hug from for so long. We're so close to no more Zoom meetings, no more online school, no more pre-recorded church services. And not to sound cliche, but we are truly, honestly, all in this together. And we have to fight through it together, from home, alone. We'll do this, we're almost there. We must stay hopeful, optimistic, and trust in God, no matter what. I'll close with the scripture reading of Romans chapter 8, verse 18, which comforts us with Paul's words. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us.
darkness, love.